Otir told his lord, King Alfred, that he dwelt the farthest north of all the Norwegians. He said that he lived in the northern part of the country, bordering the North Sea. Yet he told Alfred that that land extends very far to the north from that place, but it is all desolate, except that in a few places here and there, the Laps live by hunting in winter and by fishing along the shore in the summer. He said that on one occasion, he decided to find out how far the country extended due north and whether anyone dwelt to the north of that desolate land. Then he went due north along the coast. For the whole journey, he kept the wasteland on his starboard and the open sea on his port for three days. Then he was as far north as the whale hunters travel at their farthest. Then he still went on as far due north as he might sail in another three days. Then the land, or the estuary within the land, he could not determine which, turned there due east. But he knew that he waited there for a westerly and slightly northern wind, and then he sailed east along the coast as far as he might sail in four days. Then he had to wait there for a northerly wind, because the land, or the estuary within the land, he could not determine which, turned there due south. Then he sailed due south from there along the coast as far as he might sail in five days. Then a great river extends far inland. They turned inland up this river because they dared not sail beyond the river for fear of attack since the land on the other bank of the river was well inhabited. Otir had not previously found any inhabited country after he had left his own home, but throughout the journey, the land on his starboard side was deserted apart from fishers and fowlers and hunters. And they were all laps, and on his port lay always the open sea. The Permians had very greatly cultivated their land, but they dared not venture therein. But the land of the Turfins was all deserted, except where hunters or fowlers or fishers dwelt. The Permians gave him much information, both of their own land and the lands that lay about them, but he might not know how true it was, because he had not seen it for himself. The Laps and the Permians speak, as it seemed to him, virtually one language. Most of all, Otir went thither in addition to exploring the land for walruses, because they have very fine bones in their tusks. They brought some tusks to King Alfred, and their hides are good for ship's cables. This sea beast is much smaller than other sea beasts. It is no longer than seven ells long, but in his own country is the best whaling. They are 48 ells long, and the greatest are 50 ells long. He said that with five companions, he killed 60 in two days. Otir was a very wealthy man in those possessions in which their wealth consists, that is, in wild animals. Yet he had, when he came to visit King Alfred, 600 beasts unsold. They call these beasts reindeer. Six of them were trained as decoys. They were highly prized among the Laps, because with them, they capture wild reindeer. Otir was among the foremost men of that land, yet he did not have more than 20 head of cattle and 20 sheep and 20 pigs, and the little that he ploughed, he ploughed by horses. But their revenue is greatest in the tribute which the Laps pay to them. That tribute consists of the skins of animals and the feathers of birds, and the bones of whales and in ship's cables, which are made from the skins of whales and seals. A man of the highest rank has to contribute the skins of 15 martens and five reindeer, and one bear, and forty bushels of feathers, 
and a tunic made of bear skin or otter skin, and two ship's cables. Both must be 60 ells long. They must be made either of whale skin or of seal skin. Ottir said that the land of the Norwegians was very long and very narrow. All that a man might graze or plough lay along the coast, and even so, it was in some places very rocky, and wild moors lie to the east of and above the cultivated land. In those moors dwell the Laps, and the cultivated land is widest in an eastward direction. And always the more northerly it is, the more narrow it becomes. Eastwards it may be 60 miles wide, or a little wider, and in the middle 30 miles, wide or a little wider. And in the north, where it is most narrow, he says that it might be 3 miles wide up to the moor, and thereafter the moor is in some places so wide that a man may cross it in two weeks and in other places so wide that a man may cross it in six days. Then, alongside that land towards the south, on the other side of the moor, is Sweden, until it meets that land in the north. And alongside that land, towards the north, is the land of the Finns. Sometimes the Finns harry the Norwegians across the moor. Sometimes the Norwegians harry the Finns. And there are very great freshwater lakes throughout the moors, and the Finns carry their boats overland onto these lakes and thence attack the Norwegians. They have very small and portable boats. Ottir said that the region in which he lived is called Halogaland. He said that no one lived to the north of him. Then there is one port to the south of the region, which is called Skiringashell. He says that a man might sail thither in a month if he camped at night and had each day a favourable wind, and all this time he should sail along the coast, and on his starboard he passes first Iceland and then the islands that lie between Iceland and this land, and then this land lasts until he comes to Skiringashjall, and throughout the journey Norway lies on his port side. To the south of Skiringashjall the great Baltic Sea flows inland. It is broader than anyone may see across, and Jutland lies opposite on the other side. And then Zealand. This sea extends many hundreds of miles into the surrounding lands. And he says that in five days, he sailed from Skiringashall to the port called Hedeby. It is sighted between the lands of the Wends and the Saxons and the Angles, and it pays tribute to Denmark. When he sailed thither from Skiringashall, Denmark was on his port, and the open sea on his starboard, for three days, and then, for the two days before he came to the port of Hedeby, on his starboard lay Jutland and Zealand, and many islands. In these lands the English lived before they came hither across the sea, and for those two days, the island which pays tribute to Denmark was on his port side. 